So the next question is the lymphatic again breast. So this time we had five six questions from breast in the two papers of INICT. So it happens sometimes you get more questions from one topic, sometimes less, right? Sometimes you get four questions on, from hernia itself. It happened two three years ago, right? And this time there was hardly one or two. So the topics keep changing, but within the topics the focus remains the same, right? So all the questions were marked and uh, they were like uh, mandatory to know. Okay, lymphatic drainage of breast is predominantly done by axillary and internal memory lymph nodes. All of you know this. Now we have to match the axillary lymph nodes with their anatomical location. So this question can be put in anatomy and surgery as well. So on the left side, we have the groups of axillary lymph nodes. On the right side, we have their anatomical location. So we have to match them. So before that, let us first discuss the different anatomical groups of axillary lymph nodes. So we have five of them, pectoral, that is anterior group, which runs along the pectoralis minor. I'll show you the picture in the next slide. And uh, situated along the lateral thoracic, this again, which vessels they are situated along and which muscles they are located along, you should know that also, right? Then uh, posterior group that is subscapularis group as the name itself tells along the subscapularis vessels. Then brachial or lateral, again brachial, brachial vein, brachial vessels that means which are continuation of axillary vessels. So precisely it lies in the lateral wall along the third part of the axillary vessels. Then central as a center of the axilla, that is the axillary fat at the center. And apical, apex of axilla above the pectoralis minor tendon. I will show you the picture now, right? So apical, start with the apical, that's one. So that's the apex, that's the pectoralis minor tendon. So above the tendon of pectoralis minor, right? So that's the apical axillary lymph nodes. Then the central, in the center of the fat, the central part of fat in the axilla, then these are the lateral ones along, as you can see, that's the axillary vein along the third part of the axillary vein, axillary vessels. Then the anterior along the pectoralis minor, along the lateral thoracic vessels, and then the posterior one along the subscapular vessels, right? So these are the lymph nodes. Let's see the choices now. So anterior axillary, anterior was the pectoral, along the pectoral minor, along the lateral thoracic. So here it's written in the fat in the center of axilla. So the first choice itself is wrong, right? It's not, these are not anterior, these are the central lymph nodes. Central is uh, the brachial along the axillary vein. So this is correctly matched. Apical lymph nodes above the tendon of pectoralis minor correctly matched. Posterior, the subscapular ones along the subscapularis vessel correctly matched. So that's the answer. Incorrectly matched. Okay, which of the following statements about the gastric cancer is not false? Not false means we have to find out the true statement. Right? Now this question is based on uh, a very important classification of gastric cancers that is Lorentz classification, right? Lorentz classification that divides gastric cancers into two types, intestinal type and diffuse type. Intestinal and diffuse. Diffuse is poorly differentiated as the name itself. Remember easy, diffuse, more scattered, so not organized. So it's a bad tumor. Intestinal, intestinal means the glands are preserved, the intestinal glandular structures are preserved. So it's a better differentiation. So better differentiation means better prognosis, good tumor, right? So well differentiated tumor, poorly or undifferentiated tumors, preserved glandular formation, mostly it is associated with H. pylori infections, mostly it's seen in enteropyloric region that is distal, cancers, it is less aggressive, less malignant, that's why better prognosis. Diffuse on the other hand, no glandular formation, so it's lost, that makes it poor or undifferentiated, mostly it's uh, genetic, 
changes, CDH1 mutations, again very very important question and that leads on to loss of e cadherin protein. e cadherin is required for cohesion of the cells. Mostly it's seen in the proximal sites that is fundus and the body. It's more aggressive and more malignant and poor prognosis. Okay, now let us look at the choices. Majority of the gastric cancers are hereditary. No, only a very small portion. Majority of the gastric cancers are caused. The major risk factors are one, diet, second, H. pylori, drugs, smoking, right? So these are the major, the two most important are H. pylori and the diet. So that's a false statement. Now, E. cadherin loss is seen in majority of diffuse gastric cancers. This is true. We have just seen. Intestinal type of gastric cancers are strongly associated with mutations increasing signals via W. Now, increasing uh, increased WNT pathway signals are associated with cancers, many cancers, not just the gastric cancers. But it is equivocal in both intestinal and diffuse. So, it is not characteristic of only intestinal type. It is seen in both diffuse and intestinal. Plus, the major risk factor for intestinal type is H. pylori, which I told you here. Right? So, this is false, not entirely true. Now, depth of invasion does not have a prognostic, obviously false. Depth of invasion, depth of the tumor penetration does have a direct impact on the tumor prognosis. So, the answer here is the E. cadherin loss seen in majority of the diffuse gastric cancers. Okay, now the abdominal cox. Again, there were three, four questions on abdominal cox, right? The tubercular bacillus reaches the peritoneal cavity by all of the following routes except, right? All of you know, hematogenous is a very common route right from the focus elsewhere in the body mostly pulmonary cox spread to the abdominal cavity via blood. Now spread from the infected mesenteric lymph node, yes the bacilli can leak out of the infected mesenteric lymph node into the free peritoneal cavity. Now close contact with infected animals, close contact touching or say you can say aerosol transmission, right, or uh, some uh, airborne route of transmission. Now, this can be seen, but mainly for pulmonary infection, not for bowel. So, close contact with infected animals does not have anything to do with the bowel infection or the peritoneal infection. So, that is not the case. Now, fecal oral transmission, again, it is not a very common route in today's world, but still it is possible. All of you know the ingestion of contaminated milk with mycobacterium bovis can lead on to abdominal tuberculosis. So, the best choice here will be close contact with the infected animal. So, that is not the root for the peritoneal infection. Now, this is easy straightforward. I do not even need to discuss it. The most common site of abdominal tuberculosis, overall the choice is not here. The mesenteric lymph nodes is the most common site of infection, but in the bowel, the most common is ileocecal junction. So, the most common type of abdominal tuberculosis uh, is mesenteric lymphadenitis, but in the bowel, the most common is ileocecal junction. The reasons also you should know because ileoce in the terminal ileum, there is abundance of lymphoid tissue that makes it a favorite site for tubercular bacilli, abundance of lymphoid tissue plus relative stress is there because of stasis, because of ileocecal junction there is a valve, there is stasis in the terminal ileum and uh, there is delay in the transit that again makes it a favorable site for tubercular infection. Another question of tuberculosis, abdominal tuberculosis. Now, in a 22 year old patient, clinical features are suggestive of partial bowel obstruction. So, point to be noted. History of anorexia and weight loss, okay. Ultrasound abdomen shows ascites, another important feature. Ascitic fluid examination reveals the serum ascites albumin gradient, that is SAG ratio, very popular. 
less than one less than one that makes it a uh, exudate right raised ada raised adenosine deaminase raised exact levels have not been been given now ct shows a partial structure another important feature where in the distal small bowel with mesenteric lymphadenopathy now which of the following is the next so this is the crux of the story what do you do next right it doesn't necessarily has to be treatment part it can be in a further investigation when you have been asked next step next management so it can include both the investigation or the treatment right so let us have now what does the question tell you it's possibly it or uh, the the history the low sag ratio raised ada partial structure on ct with mesenteric lymph nodes it's a perfect scenario for abdominal cox right most likely it's a it's a question about abdominal cox straightforward but none of the findings is confirmatory they are indicative they haven't confirmed it yet right okay now the choice is aspirate mesenteric lymph node under image guidance yes that can be done now capsule endoscopy is not needed because everything we know now what extra information will get on capsule endoscopy so that is not the next step definitely trial of empirical att att if it comes out to be a tubercular case then definitely will be going for att but empirical empirical means without a certain diagnosis based on only the experience like is the case here because the diagnosis is not yet completely confirmed so empirical att nowadays the latest recommendations are you should not give att unless your diagnosis is confirmed but in this case we do not have a confirmed diagnosis so this choice is again also out now laparotomy and resection of the structure followed by att patient has a small bowel obstruction it's a partial obstruction for 6 months there is no emergency no peritonitis no acute obstruction right so what is the hurry so there is really no indication for the laparotomy as the next step so this is definitely out so we are left with a that's the answer because i have been telling you again and again this is not a confirmed case right more than 95% probability is there but still not confirmed so we need to confirm the diagnosis first and the best way to confirm the diagnosis in this case is histopathology so aspirate do an fnac ultrasound guided or ct guided image guided fnac from the mesenteric lymph node and you will get a histopathological confirmation then start the att okay that's the answer next question the patient underwent appendectomy or appendectomy on second post operative day patient complains of increased pain and has this is important hypotension means bleeding during laparotomy large amount of blood loss was found in the peritoneal cavity due to a vascular injury during appendectomy so what should we do now which of the following vessel should be ligated this is again very very simple question the blood supply of appendix that is appendicular artery comes from ileocolic artery so we need to ligate the ileocolic artery to stop the bleeding this is very simple and straightforward so that's the blood supply of the uh, ileocecal junction so ileocolic artery which is a branch of superior mesenteric artery it gives off a superior division that goes off to anastomose with the middle colic artery uh, sorry right colic artery then the inferior division inferior division gives one anterior cecal then the posterior cecal and then the appendicular so most likely after appendectomy if there is a bleeding any of these branches could have been injured so to stop bleeding ligate the main ileocolic artery right that's very simple and straightforward okay next question 
a 58 year old male patient is diagnosed with cancer in the proximal now this is the very very important point proximal transverse colon is the location because it's a location of the tumor that will help you in deciding what surgical procedure is needed now which of the following vessels will be ligated for the safe oncological outcome first of all what surgery you will do for a proximal transverse colonic cancer right let me show you the pictures first first we'll discuss the blood supply of the colon majority of it comes from the superior mesenteric and uh, some from the inferior mesenteric right so starting with this uh, that's a superior mesenteric so that's the ileocolic right before ileocolic also it gives out many jejunal ileal branches and one branch goes up also to the duodenum and pancreas that is inferior pancreatic or duodenal so ileocolic is the first one for the large bowel then second you have the right colic then the third you have the middle colic right so that's uh, uh, these are the three major branches supplying the right half of the the colon that is the large bowel okay now the middle colic divides into the right branch and the left branch so that's a right branch of middle colic that's the left branch of the middle colic so this is about the superior mesenteric then the inferior mesenteric you have the left colic the superior and the inferior branches then you have the sigmoid branches and then finally it continues as a superior rectal artery so these are the branches of inferior mesenteric now if there is a tumor in the cecum or say in the mid ascending colon or even the hepatic flexure the choice of surgery is right hemicolectomy but if there is a tumor in the uh, say proximal transverse colon then this surgery is not sufficient then we need to extend the surgical margin to right two third this becomes extended right hemicolectomy so that's a procedure needed here it's a proximal transverse colon so we don't need simple right hemicolectomy but we need to go for extended right hemicolectomy so for extended right hemicolectomy what all vessels will have to ligate again very easy so we need to remove from the terminal ileum so the ileocolic has to be gone then uh, right colic is ligated and middle colic if it is a simple right hemicolectomy then we ligate only the the right branch of the mid, uh, the middle colic but if it is extended then we need to ligate both the branches or the main trunk of the middle colic let me show you the better pictures right so on the left side we have right hemicolectomy simple one so in this as you can see so uh, the ileocolic is gone the ileocolic is gone the right colic is gone and the right branch of middle colic the left is you can see the red color this is intact so the left branch of middle colic is intact so that's the right hem but if it is extended then even the left branch is gone so complete entire ileocolic entire right colic entire middle colic so that's the extended right hemicolectomy there is one more catch to this the tumor is in the proximal transverse colon but if the tumor is slightly distal to it then even this is not sufficient then now we have to extend even the extended right hemicolectomy so many people depending on the exact location of the tumor even the extended right hemicolectomy can be further extended to even include the splenic flexure so that's a case here right say the tumor is here so now the even the extended right hemicolectomy is not sufficient in this we have to go re to resect till this level that is uh, descending colon and even the splenic flexure is removed now in this case even the upper branch of coming from the left colic artery that needs to be ligated so that's again a form but this is a case about proximal transverse colon it has been specified here so let us look at the choices ileocolic right colic right branch 
that's a classical situation for right hemicolectomy. So that's not the answer here. Iliocolic artery, right colic and trunk of the middle colic. So that's a classical extended right hemicolectomy. So that's a situation, that's a case, this one. So uh, this is the procedure we need to do and we need to ligate only iliocolic, right colic and the complete middle colic. Third, only middle colic doesn't make any sense. So it's out. Iliocolic, right colic, middle colic and proximal or upper branch of left colic. This is the last example I told you, the, this one. This is uh, the choice four is this situation. But this is needed when the uh, tumor is slightly away, distal into the transverse colon. So, but this is specified as proximal transverse colon. So this is sufficient. So that's the answer, right? So this is how you calculate what all vessels we need to ligate. Okay, now a renal question, a 20, a 55 year old male patient presents with hematuria, old age hematuria, old age hematuria, immediately. The thing that starts coming to your mind, RCC. Okay, CT shows a mass in the kidney as shown with internal vascularity, again goes in favor of malignancy, a cancer. Which of the following is, so even if the image was not given, straightforward diagnosis based on the theory is RCC. Still, let us have, now in this as picture you can see that's the mass in the left kidney. Renal cyst, no way. Renal cell carcinoma is the answer here. Oncocytoma, renal angiomyolipoma, both are benign tumors and the history and the features here are suggestive of some malignancy, right? So I'll tell them uh, uh, one by one. So that's how the cyst looks like. It's a no contrast uptake, non-enhanced, a simple round or oval or a smoothly outlined mass, right? So that's a simple cyst, easy to make out. Oncocytoma is a benign tumor. And remember this, it's very, very difficult to differentiate it from RCC based on epidemiology, even the presentation, imaging and even the histology can be similar. But three quarter patients are asymptomatic and they do not that commonly present with hematuria as the RCC. So clinically, they mostly present as large mass as the flank lump. That's how the renal oncocytoma looks like on CT scan. Now the angiomyolipoma is again a benign tumor and uh, mostly it's sporadic but it can be familial as seen in tuberous sclerosis and as the name says it's a combination of three tissues, vascular, smooth muscles and fat. Mostly it doesn't present with hematuria, it presents with bleeding but other way that is retroperitoneal bleeding. So retroperitoneal hematoma and risk is more in 4 centimeter more than 4 cm size cancers and very popularly it is known as Wunderlich syndrome. This is basically because of huge retroperitoneal hematoma can lead to shock. So this is Wunderlich syndrome and CT the characteristic features is the fat. The macroscopic fat is visible and you can easily differentiate it from the RCC. So that's how the renal angiomyolipoma looks like on CT scan.